So today will be mostly for people who have gardens and uh, house plants. And then just an overview, uh, just to get a basic understanding of what's, what Shemitah year. There's some very basic fundamentals that if we understand them, then we'll understand a lot of what's permitted and a lot of what's not permitted. Okay, uh, so basically like this. The mitzvah of Shemitah is a mitzvah from the Torah, which applies mostly to fields, right? Not private homes, that's, a, that's a, already a mafloka or a suffix in the Yerushalmi. If a private home and your garden and things like that are obligated in Shemitah, we'll see that anyways, we're, we're machmir, we're stringent in our homes as well. But generally it's a mitzvah in the fields, in orchards and vineyards, that the land is meant to rest during the seventh year. <coughs> the produce of that land is meant to be for consumption only, right? Meaning you cannot take Shemitah fruits and use them for other things. Uh, it's a question whether or not it's a Torah commandment not to sell them either, but certainly rabbinically we don't sell fruit of Shemitah, it's for consumption. But it also means that the fields and the trees and all that are not to be worked during the seventh year. Now, what's important to know is that there are certain types of work which are prohibited from the Torah, and there are certain types of work which are prohibited on a level of the from, from the rabbis. And there's actually an important distinction between the two, because everything which is prohibited on a Torah level, you may not do during the seventh year, even if that means that you will suffer financial loss on that tree or on that plant or whatever it is. Things which are only prohibited on the rabbinic level, you can do during the seventh year if you need to do it to prevent the loss, a financial loss, or if there's going to be irreparable damage to the plant. Meaning if the, if there's some damage will be done to the plant, but it will recover the following year, that's not called an irreparable loss. But in order to maintain the plant, that's basically the, the guideline is called the ukme, in order to have a kium, in order to sustain it. One can do things which are even prohibited durabanan, if that's what you have to do in order to keep the plant alive. We're never meant to allow the plant, the, the function is, the point is to get it to flourish, it's the minimum that we need to do to keep the plant alive that you can do only when the isras are abundant. Now, to make it very, very simple, the things which are prohibited on the Torah level is planting. So planting means you can't put seeds in the ground. <coughs> planting means you can't take a tree, a sapling, and put that into the ground and everything that goes along with that. You can't do um, um, recover, you can't, um, plant one tree into another. Graft. Grafting. You can't do grafting of trees. You can't do a racha either. You can't take a tree and then you bend over the branch and you plant it in the ground and then that creates a, that has roots and then you cut it in half. Right? All of those things are forbidden and also included in that is also trimming branches in order to um, pruning. Pruning. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we don't prune trees either during Shemitah because that's like like all the, the same reason why you plant, you're trying to all create growth in the plant. Okay, those are all, that's Torah prohibition. As well, we don't do uh, harvesting during the seventh year. Now, just to be clear, the Torah says you don't do Kitsira, which means you don't harvest. Um, so the question is, we know that we eat fruit during the seventh year, so if we don't harvest, what do we do? Right, meaning that's, that's how we get the fruits, we have to harvest them. So the point is that the harvesting that we do during the seventh year is only done for the amount that's needed for consumption. We'll talk about more of that next week. We don't do harvesting in the normal way, which means that we take large batches, some of it goes to storage, some of it goes to the market, we, you know, um, the way we cut it, um, 
harvesting, a lot of it is done with machinery of some type. Either it's done by hand, or it's done with some sort of other difference in the way that things are harvested. And we only take exactly the amount which we need. And so therefore, it's not called that you're harvesting. Right? Like and we said, harvesting is when you go out to the field and you take everything. Some of it's sold, some of it's stored. Right? Uh, you use specific tools. We don't do that during the 17th. The third prohibition, which is, doesn't say specifically in the verse, but our sages learned out, is harisha, is plowing. We don't plow during the seventh uh, year, during the Shemitah year, right? Preparing the ground for planting. Those are the things which are prohibited on a Torah level. So everything else, meaning most of the stuff that most of us are gonna run into, are going to be the Rabbanu. For example, watering your garden is going to be the Rabbanu. Right, it all comes from the first. The first says the land should rest. So the Rabbanu threw in a bunch of other prohibitions. Watering, fertilizing, um, you can help me again, composting, right? Composting, um, even clearing the yard from rocks, because those are things which inhibit plant growth. Right, so even clearing your yard from rocks, um, the pesticides, and uh, weeding, right? Removing weeds, all of those things are the abundance, and they cannot be done on the Shemitah year, except for, as we'll see, under certain conditions, we'll see what those are. Okay, so that is the Dereces and the Durban. Now, a very important point, like this. Uh, everybody is obligated in the mitzvah of Shemitah, men and women alike, even though it's a mitzvah shez on drum. Right? It only happens every seven years. And still, because there's an iser lav, because there's a prohibition uh, uh, during the Shemitah year, women are obligated in the prohibition, and therefore they're also obligated in all the positive mitzvahs because we have a claw. That whenever a lav and an ase come together, whenever a prohibition and a positive commitment are together, so women are they're connected into one mitzvah, and women are obligated in the entire mitzvah. That's why women are obligated also in the shamor aspect of Shabbos and the zafar aspect of Shabbos, right? The, the, the negatives and the positives together. Okay, uh, also children. Uh, who reach Gil Chinuch uh, are obligated in the midst of the Shemitah, obviously in, in the level of Chinuch, on the level of, of Derbana. But, however, if you see a child uh, who's not yet a mitzvah, be machalo shviz, be machalo the mitzvah of Shemitah, uh, the Pashtas is uh, the straightforward halacha is that you have to stop them not allow them to desecrate uh, Shemitah. Okay, we have that prohibition that applies to other areas of Shemitah as well, it applies here as well. Now, nowadays, the mitzvah of Shemitah, according to most Roshonim, is a Durban. And that's because um, it's connected to the mitzvah of Yovel. And the mitzvah of Yovel, according to Rebbe, and a Gemara that Gersha knows very well, um, according to Rabbi, when there's no face of Mikdash, there's no mitzvah of Yovel. If there's no mitzvah of Yovel, there's no Shemitah. And therefore, according to most Rishonim, and unlike Rabbi, Shemitah nowadays is a Durbanan, it's not a Durbanan. It's not a Torah level commandment, it's a rabbinic commandment. Now, an important distinction to make. Um, and it's, it is a distinction which is critical over here. The Ashkenazi world here in Eretz Yisrael, I mean, that's where the myth is pertinent. The Chazanish was very strong about the fact that we are not lenient on Shemitah because it's a Durban. There are certain Durbanans that you just see that not, well, let's put it this way, not all Durbanans are created equally. Normally we say Safik Durbanan Lakula. However, there are certain Durbans where we don't say that. One example that the Chazan Ish brings is Malicha, right? Salting meat. 
Now, according to the Torah, if you roast the meat, you don't have to salt it. And yet, no from Jew in the world, if he had a suffolk, if he had a doubt whether or not his meat was salted, would say, suffolk or bayam lakula. It's something that we've all taken on like it's a deraisa. So too, that was the attitude of the Chazan Ish on Shemitah. We look at Shemitah as though it's a deraisa. We don't paskin, we don't uh, come out with halachas, with leniencies every time there's some sort of a doubt or disagreement between the post scheme. Uh, for the most part, we are stringent. Now, the question why is an interesting question. What's unique about Shemitah? Possibly it's because the source of Shemitah is from the Torah. Generally, we are stringent on Durbanans when their source is from the Torah. For example, Gershon, Kiddush, right? Kiddush at night, uh, we're far more stringent about than Kish during the day. Also, Kish during the day, the Rabbanan were metakin it over a coast. They said it should be over a cup. And therefore, we're not lenient uh, on Kiddush the way we are on Havdalah, which according to most Roshonim is not a Torah level mitzvah. The other thing is obviously we know the importance of Shemitah and its connection to our ability to be here in Eretz Yisrael. Um, as the uh, Yirmiya, the prophet Jeremiah tells us, and, and our sages tell us, that our ability to be here in Eretz Yisrael is because we keep Shemitah. And if we followed all the leniencies that you could follow, you literally would not know that it was Shemitah. You could literally go the entire seventh year and have no idea. You could actually garden. Right? You could grow plants with no Kedusha, with no special sanctity. You could purchase things in the supermarket and you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know if we followed all the leniencies that are available to us. Flashkanism tend to be quite strict during Shemitah. Now, that doesn't mean that Sephardim are not. It's just that there are certain leniencies that Sephardim rely on that Ashkenazim don't. And even some of those leniencies, like we'll discuss next week, there's a certain leniencies that they said, okay, yes, this is permissible, but unless you have no choice, don't do it. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Some of the uh, things which were permitted to people living in Eretz Israel, here in the land of Israel, were permitted a hundred years ago when people were literally dying in the streets from starvation and cholera, right? It, I don't know if, if everybody realizes it, but it, but it was not an easy place. Eretz Israel was not an easy place to live. I mean, people complain about it now. But a hundred years ago, people literally were dying in the streets. It was really not only a select few people were willing to make Aliyah because of the challenges of living here, especially when it was under the control of the uh, Ottoman Turks. Okay, so, so even though nowadays it's a Durbanan, we still look at it, for the most part, like it's a Torah-level mitzvah. Okay, um, good. So we spoke about the difference between um, Dereses and Durabanans. Uh Someone has a fruit tree. It's very important. We said you could do anything that you need to do in the Durabanans in order to sustain um, your plants. The Chazun Ish says that with fruits, with a fruit tree, the Chazun Ish actually says that anything which is going to damage the quality of the fruits or the either the production, the amount of fruits or the quality of the fruits, that's called a nezek, that's called the damage to the fruit, to the tree, and you are allowed to uh, water for all these things that we spoke about to the extent that you need in order to get a normal crop of fruits during the Shemitah year. Okay. The exception would be pruning, right? Yeah, no, not, uh, we'll, talk, we'll get into more of the details, but, okay. but here he's talking mo mostly about watering, but yeah, anything you need to do for, for a normal batch of fruits. Right. That's according to the Chazanish. Okay, now, the reason I want to do this one first is because there is one important thing to know for Erev Shvius, and that's only if someone's planning on planting anything. Okay? So anyone who looks at the Mishnah in Shvius will see that there are uh, there's a concept of Tosefet 
Shvi'is that you have to add on to the seventh year, and there's a whole discussion in the Tanaim how much we have to add on. Nowadays, the Shemitah is not from the Torah, it's a Durabana. We do not add anything onto the seventh year, and technically, most everything you can do in your garden up until the day before Rosh Hashanah. Whatever you need to do up to Rosh Hashanah, you can do. The exception to that rule is planting. If anybody wishes to plant a fruit tree, we'll talk about non-fruit bearing trees in a second, but anyone wants to plant a fruit tree, it must be planted 44 days before Rosh Hashanah. Okay, it's not a random number. We'll explain where 44 comes from. Uh, so we want to have, uh, to give the plant the ability to become rooted in the soil before the Shemitah year comes in, so that it's not rooting itself during the Shemitah year, right? You put it in a plant, it takes time. Right at the beginning, you have to water it extra, take extra care of it, make sure it's more shaded, because it takes time for what's called klita, right? Just like you went to, right? You went, you got a sal klita, you went to the, right? There's a klita, there's a time of acclimating into the soil, right? And Chazal put that time at two weeks. Okay, so uh, plants need two weeks to acclimate in there, or given two weeks to acclimate into the soil. So that's 14 days. How do we get to 44 days? So it's a very interesting Maris Ayan issue. Good old Mori. He always messes everything up for us. Uh, with trees, we know that you cannot eat the fruit of a, plant, a newly planted tree until the, there's the three years of Orla, then there's the fourth year of Netaravite. But if a person plants a tree, even two weeks before Shemitah, it's still considered that it hasn't had enough time in the previous year to be counted as the first year. And so therefore the counting of the years for that tree will start as though the first year is during the Shemitah year. And so therefore by the time the fruits become permissible, everyone will say, wait a second, that means he planted it during Shemitah. Therefore, you have to have a 30-day period, a full month, in order for it to be considered as that that tree grew during the previous year, right? So this year on Tav Shin Pei Aleph, so in order for your fruit tree to be considered a Tav Shin Pei Aleph fruit tree, it, has, it needs two weeks of acclimating into the soil, plus 30 days, it's a full month of being a Tav Shin Pei Aleph tree, yeah? Uh, and then, once you get to Taf Shin Pei Base, that's already considered the second year of the growth of the tree. Okay. We'll also learn a little interesting <coughs> halacha of Barla along the way. So therefore, anyone planning on planting any fruit trees, it has to be done 44 days before Rosh Hashanah. Now, uh, non-fruit bearing tree, Ilane Srak, trees that are, you know, for shade or other things, are not fruit bearing trees. Uh, according to uh, the Chazun Ish, you can plant them up until the day before Rosh Hashanah, it doesn't matter. What kind of trees? Non-fruit bearing trees. <coughs> according to Rosh Hashanah Zaman Arbach, uh, they still need two weeks for Kalita to acclimate to the soil, so they should be done two weeks before Rosh Hashanah. The Shevet Levi. Haskins that ideally you should try to uh, follow the Rosh Hashanah <coughs> and if for whatever reason you didn't make it in time, you can rely on the Chazanish and plant it the day before Rosh Hashanah. Vegetables are a different story. Vegetables need the two weeks because you don't want the vegetable to start acclimating to the soil during Shemitah, but there's another issue which we'll talk about more next week which is something called Sfichim. Svichin is based on uh, vegetables that grow wild, but also vegetables that grow in a person's own garden. There was a, there's a concern that, uh, uh, you, you see there was a challenge, always, even back in the time of the base of Mikdash, just like there is now, people are very challenged by Shemitah. It's a very difficult mitzvah. It's, it's, there's a reason why it's a mitzvah that, that helps us to build uh, bitachon, because it's very challenging. And you had Ramayim, um, how would we call a Ramay? Like, not like a con man, but... Uh, 
hucksters. Maybe huckster? Politicians. No, they weren't politicians. Oh, they were just like, you know, guys who were trying to... You confuse hucksters with politicians. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> That's the right word, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, these hucksters. I just feel, I just now, because of working on that picture, with suspenders. These hucksters, um, what would they do? They would plant things during Shemitah, and they would say, oh, no, I planted this before Shemitah, or oh, it just happened to grow here, right? So because of that, our sages prohibited anything that begins to sprout uh, during the seventh year, even wild uh, growth, or anything that was um, planted even during the sixth year, but it hasn't started to blossom, was also prohibited because at that point, they could still plant it at the beginning of the seventh year and say, no, no, I planted this during the sixth year. I have a question about this. Is there a tremendous emphasis, you know, when you're, I know that you can talk about it later, when you're purchasing things, to purchase them from the right kind of individual, right? That individual, who is the right kind of individual, wouldn't sell you something that had been planted during Shemitah. Yeah, we'll talk next week about what's the right kind of individual and how you know that they're the right kind of individual. Right. But there are a lot of well-meaning people who are the right kinds of individuals who could still sell you things which you don't want to purchase. So we'll talk about that next week for sure. Yeah? But here now I want to talk about you. Right? The provision of Svichin creates the following issue. If you plan on planting anything, if you do it two weeks before Shvi'is, it's going to be a chaval because during Shvi'is you're going to have to rip it up out of the ground because it's going to fall under the prohibition of Svichin. And so therefore, you need to make sure that it begins to blossom before the seventh year comes in. Now what does that mean? That's a, that's a disagreement amongst uh, the poskim. According to the Chazanish, once it begins to blossom and sprout before the seventh year, you're good. According to Rav Shlomo Zalman, it has to reach what's called Shir Maestros. Uh, if it's uh, anything which is fruit bearing or vegetable, right? It has cucumbers or tomatoes or zucchinis or anything like that. So according to the Chazanish, that means that you have to have the beginning of the fruit has to happen before the seventh year comes in. According to Rosh Hashanah, is actually more machmer over here. Uh, you have to actually reach Shur Meiser, meaning the point at which a, people would actually eat it. Right? So according to the Chazanish, you have the beginning of a little baby tomato or baby cucumber, nobody would eat it. Right? But according to Rosh Hashanah, it has to be enough that someone would say, oh, I would eat that, that's Shur Meiserus, to the point where you could actually Meiser it, because it's considered that's the vegetable. Right? That has to already exist before the third year comes in. And if you're growing uh, beans or grains, which probably most of us don't, but if you choose to, all of a sudden you're going to grow barley this year or something like that, uh, it's a third of the height of the plant has to happen during the sixth year. Okay? And then the seventh year they're not considered sfichin. Fruit trees don't fall under this prohibition of sfichin at all, which we'll talk about more next week. Uh, because you can't get a fruit tree to start producing vegetables or fruits in, in, I mean, fruits in a short period of time, right? So therefore, we're not concerned that someone's going to suddenly plant a tree and, right, it takes a very long time before trees produce fruit. Interestingly enough, other things fall into this category, like bananas, that even though bananas are really a grass, they're not actually a tree, but because you, they won't produce fruit in a short period of time, there's no provision of sfichin on bananas, for example. What about a fruit tree that you, you find it's already ready to produce fruit? It's not attached to the ground. Well, so the whole question in, in, in with everything, with Meiser and Orla and all these things about when you move trees from, when you um, transplant them from one place to another. And that's a whole discussion about how much dirt uh, stays on the, on the roots as to whether it's called that you actually have removed the tree from its environment and replanted it, which is very traumatizing for trees. Generally, they try to put a large amount of soil under it. Uh, that's, that is a machlokas ha um, which leads to some 
pretty interesting kulas and things like blueberries and other things like that is how much soil is called enough but but that 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 goes on the whole question of how much soil was around it yeah what's the concern with non fruit bearing trees uh, being planted in Shemitah if they don't produce a crop that has so you're not allowed to you're not allowed to pr to plant anything during Shemitah you're not allowed to plant flowers you're not allowed to plant bushes you're not allowed to plant right so therefore we want we want to make sure they're planted before Shemitah. The Chazanish says as long as you get them in the ground before Shemitah. There's Roshom Azalman who's more machmer and says no, they have to actually acclimate to the soil before Shemitah. But it's not because of Svichin, it's because is it called that you planted during Shemitah or not. That's the concern, right? According to Roshom Azalman, if it's still acclimating to the soil, it's called that you planted a tree during the Shemitah year, which is prohibited. Good? Clear? Yeah. Actually, um, is the whole thing of Shemitah like about eating though the food? Is no. Is it like letting no. the land rest, don't get benefit from the land in terms of the food? No. And if so, then why would we care about planting flowers? Meaning, meaning, like, oh, oh, so first of all, there's a question, the word akhla means consumption. So we'll see that flowers also have Kedusha as as well. Right? You can't just take flowers and, and, and do whatever you want with them. They also have Kedusha Shavis. Um, anything that you benefit from the fruit of it. And even if that fruit's not necessarily for consumption, we'll talk about those examples as well. But again, the verse says that the fruit is for eating. Right? Now, that we learn is, comes to teach us about certain prohibitions. Therefore, you can't harvest it to store it. Therefore, you can't sell it. Right? According to most opinions, there's no obli I mean, according to everybody, there's no obligation to eat anything during the seventh year. There's no obligation. According to the Ramban, there's a mitzvah, what's called the mitzvah kiyumis. Right? Meaning it's not a mitzvah kiyumis, you're not obligated to do it, but just like matzah, according to the Vilna Gon, on the final six days of Pesach, you get a mitzvah for eating it. You're not obligated. The first day you're obligated. The other, the rest of the time, you're not obligated, right? You get a mitzvah for eating it. So there's, a, there's one opinion that you have a mitzvah for eating fruits that have kedusha shviz. We can talk about why it's a, why the, the benefits of eating fruit, which is a kedusha shviz, but certainly that's not the the mitzvah. The mitzvah is that the land should be rested um, during this time period. There's a lot of interesting reasons for the mitzvah that the chinuch brings. Uh, Shlomo, for example, one of them is to train people to provide for the poor. But that's, certainly if you look at the verses, the verse is to rest the land. That's what it's about. Yeah? Okay. Um, great. Okay, so one final caveat, which is important to get to before we get to the, start talking about people's gardens and whatnot is even all the abundance which we said that a person can do in order to sustain any plants that they have, uh, it's still a person should go out of their way to do them before Rosh Hashanah. Meaning if you have a tree that you want to cut down and you want to trim it, and even if it's for just sustaining the tree, not necessarily for the benefit of the tree, a person should go out of their way to do it before Shavuos. Whatever you can do before the seventh year, you should do before the seventh year and not wait until the seventh year comes in. By the way, very worthwhile, anyone who has a garden, to speak to a gardener. As a matter of fact, some posts can say it's a condition. Uh, in order to do any of the rabbinically forbidden uh, acts, is you talk to a gardener and you say, what is the bare minimum I need to do in order to sustain my garden this year. I'm not talking about having it flourish. I'm not talking about having it be beautiful. How much do I need to water it? Is there anything else I need to do? The bare minimum. Are there any things that need to be trimmed? Right? And whatever can be done before the seventh year should be done before the seventh year and not, a uh, person should not wait to do it during the seventh year. Okay, so let's talk about gardens and all that means. What it means to, to do the bare minimum to sustain something. All the conversation right now, up to now, has been about both the field and the garden, or just oh, the field? Uh, well, so, so, okay, good. So let's get to this point right now. Uh, your, your garden, as long as it's in open air, is still like the field. 
Okay, there's a question in your house, which we'll get to. Uh, for example, let's say a person has a courtyard in their house. Can they plant vegetables in there? Can they, they plant vegetables in the courtyard in the middle of their house? Because the Pasuk's talking about the field. It didn't say anything about your house. Well, actually, that's the, that's the, the suffolk. That's the doubt in the Yerushalmi because it says that the, it, there's, a, there's one verse that talks about the field and one verse that talks about the year and, and us as individuals. And so it's not clear if your house should apply. But your garden, if it's open air or garden and the whole thing, that's the same as a field. Okay? Okay, so um, watering your garden in order to sustain uh, during the rainy season, when it's raining, we don't water the garden at all. We rely on the rain. It's not necessary to water it. The rain does not sustain it. We don't water during the rainy season. If a person has to water their garden during the Shemitah year, uh, doing it indirectly is certainly preferable. Meaning if a person can set up a sprinkler system, it's definitely better than doing it by hand. Um, Good. Uh, most shrubs, uh, bushes, don't need to be watered at all. Most of them will not sustain irreparable damage during the seventh year if you don't water them. So most of those don't have to be watered at all. Again, that's all with the consultation of a gardener. I'm not taking responsibility for anybody's shrubs and bushes. I'm not a gardening professional, but from the, the post can say that most uh, bushes and shrubs don't need to be watered during the seventh year. Uh, what about washing floors in your house, hanging laundry, all sorts of things which could bring uh, water out into your garden unintentionally? Um, so if it's, if it's mixed with very strong chemicals, then it's not a problem. Clearly, it's not for the benefit of your garden. But a lot of things that go out there, including uh, air conditioning, water, and, and, and water from hanging out clothes, and things like that, um, like this. There's... There's two reasons why it's not a concern. One is you have no intention of watering your field. That's not your intention. That's not why you're doing it. The second thing is that it's clear. We don't have to worry about Mori over here because everybody who sees it understands that's not how you water a garden. You don't water a garden by hanging your laundry over it. So nobody looking in will be concerned that, uh, that you're trying to water your garden. So therefore, all those things, washing floor, hanging laundry, all the things that you don't have any kavan and it's clear that that's not your intention, you have no concern, you're not, you can do that all during Shemitah. If anybody is interested in being machmer, according to Rav Eliyashiv, you may not do any of those things. <laughs> Rav Eliyashiv is machmer in this area because even though it's unintentional, uh, you have what's called eno miskavit v'nichalik. Because your garden will benefit ultimately in the end anyways, it doesn't really matter whether or not you have intention or not. Okay, but that's the Mahmer opinion. There are lenient opinions that permit, right? So according to Rabbi Yashiv, you have to make sure that your air conditioner is not dripping into your garden. Because that's an Eino Miskaven that, that's Nihale. Okay, that's the very Mahmer opinion. Everyone should know the opinions and then consult your LOR, what's good for you. Okay. So, uh, not all of these Durbanans, as we said, are necessarily the same level. Watering is something that has to happen for most plants, otherwise they will die. But weeding is not necessarily the case. Most plants can survive if, even if you don't pull the weeds. The same is true for fertilizing uh, or composting. Most plants will, be, will survive even if you don't fertilize them or compost them, uh, even trimming them. However, if that's not the case by your plant. Apparently there's a fertilizer that is a slow release fertilizer that you can put in prior to Rosh Hashanah and it releases the fertilizer I think for six months or something like that. Which is kosher, apparently. Okay. I mean, it's an interesting according question to according to the book. Okay, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, you'd have to ask why it's different than like a sprinkler system, meaning it's a grama, so you're not directly responsible for it, but it is something that you set up the situation to occur at the beginning, so there may be a difference of opinion among post scheme whether or not that would be permissible. Mm -hmm. But for somebody who has it, it's permissible. Apparently, there's a slow release fertilizer that will work for six months. Okay, um, so good. So 
all of the things that we spoke about, uh, weeding, uh, fertilizing, all of these things. Um, so for, let's take weeding for example. Lechatchila, if a person needs to weed because they're worried that it's going to damage their plant. Lechatchila, meaning the primarily it should be done by hand. Because as we said, we want to do these things with a shinui, right? Um, that's the best possibility. If a person finds he can't do it by hand, then he could use, um, you know, like a hoe, one of these like, you know, weeding tools. As if you have names, you can help me. Yeah, just, you know, sickle. <laughs> a sickle. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, fine. Um, good. Uh, also, if, uh, if a person's concerned about uh, wildfires or snakes, which is probably less concern for us, but people in Moshavim might have that concern, um, uh, snakes hiding in the brush or wildfires, then yes, they, could, they can remove all of that stuff because obviously those are things which can cause damage and we're only talking about durabundance over here, things which are prohibited durabundance. Um, yeah, trimming, if, yeah. If you're doing something in your garden, not in order to enhance growth, but let's say it's for appearance. Uh, your grass is going to grow very high or your weeds are going to cover your roses. So you're not concerned so much about enhancing the growth of the roses, but you're concerned about the appearance of your garden. Yeah. So you're not enhancing growth. Anyway, your is not to enhance the growth. Yes, yeah, so there's a question about things which are grown for beauty. For example, roses, then you're going to come into a similar question like the Chazanish says about fruit, right? But just like by fruit, you can do whatever it takes to get a healthy batch of fruit. You don't have to lose out on the fruits. So with the roses, for example, normally you don't trim, you don't have to trim the um, thorns growing around the roses because they're not going to damage the plant, but they could damage the roses, right? So for example, uh, in such a case, if it's something which is for noy, like a, like a flower, uh, you can protect the flower, you can trim it, but it should be done with a shinui and lechatchila, primarily, you should get a non-Jewish gardener to do it. But that, that wasn't my question. Because, again, that's protecting the growth of the flower, right? My question is if something is entirely aesthetic, right? it has nothing to do with I want to enhance the growth, but I want to come out in my garden and see my roses instead of having them being covered by right, weeds. Right, so this is what I'm trying to answer for you. It, it doesn't have to do with the welfare of the, the rose, it has to do with the aesthetic of the rose. So this is, so things which are grown for beauty, right, and, and the, by getting, allowing them to grow wild, you damage their ability to become beautiful, then there are certain things you're allowed to do, and preferably through a non-Jew. However, just because I want my garden to look neat and organized and all that, but that's not the function of a garden, and, and so you cannot do it during the seventh year. Is, it, is that clear or not? No, it's not clear. Not, didn't come out clear? Well, what, I, what I'm saying is that, you know, you plant harvest and all the watering, pruning, all those things have to do with enhancing the growth of produce, some, some kind of product. And that's all, whether it's rabbinic or tor, it's forbidden. Granted, right? My question is, if you're not doing anything that enhances the growth of something, and you're not doing it because I want to have, you know, better lemons or whatever, I'm doing it because I want to be able to see my lemon tree. Oh, good. So let's let me try. I'm gonna try this again. So, anything from the Torah is prohibited, hands down, no matter what the situation is. Right. Anything which is durabanan, you can do in order to sustain the plant, and that's it. However, when it comes to fruit, sustain the plant means allowing there to be a full crop of fruits. And when it comes to plants whose function it is to be beautiful, to be aesthetic, then that's part of the sustenance of the plant, you sustain the beauty of that plant. Okay. But that's not the function of your carrots, and it's not the function of your lemon tree. Even right. the lemons have the flowers, and they're beautiful. But that's not the function of the lemon tree. Right. 
Okay, and so therefore, you cannot just clean up areas because you want them to look nice, unless specifically, that's what the function of this plant is. It's a plant that's planted for the sake of beauty. Like, a, you know, I don't know, lilacs or something mm -hmm. like that. Okay? Okay, good. Um, okay, good. And again, any trimming that may need to be done preferably really should be done by a non-Jew. Okay, also tying trees to direct their growth. Uh, is forbidden because that's again promoting the growth unless again it's to help to keep the tree from getting damaged or, or sustain a loss in some way. Now here's an interesting one. If a person lives in an area with a shared courtyard or has a renter, things get a little bit interesting. What happens when you live in an apartment building and you very much want to keep Shmita and the other people in the building don't? So primarily, you should try to convince them not to do malacha in the garden during the seventh year. Some neighbors are easier to convince than others. If your neighbors uh, are anyways going to go ahead and do it, you should do your best to not pay for it. If you anyways have to pay for it, because if you don't, your neighbors will take you to court, or it will create a uh, conflict within your building you can say to your neighbors I'm not paying this money for the work you're doing in the garden I'm giving money to but buy it or whatever it is but as far as I'm concerned it's all for electricity and Clean. maintenance and things like that I don't think I have no share in whatever you do in the garden okay it gets a little bit more complicated if you have Shutfis, if you own something with two people. Uh, then there's a question if it's enough to say, you do what you do, I'm not interested, or if you actually have to be mafkir, if you actually have to make your part of, of the agreement ownerless for the seventh year in order to say I'm not involved. It's a question of the post game. Yeah. Going, if they're going in your building or not? If they're going, they can do whatever they want. I'm saying if the guy buys their building, going out there, going. So, I mean, there's a if they're making the decision, I'm saying for, for the most, but they're, it's a little bit of an issue because it could be a question of they're, they're doing it as shlichus for the people in your building. But for the most part, a guy can do whatever he wants during Shemitah. We'll see that, by the way, uh, with, with Nachri uh, produce, right? A goy can, can, can have a garden and he can plant and he can grow and he can do whatever he wants. And you can purchase the produce from him. There's just a, a machloket as whether or not it has the sanctity of the seventh year. It reduces the, the issue of, of me uh, paying and other stuff? Or is it that this definitely makes it more room for leniency, for sure. What was the question? Uh, what happens if Vibe Bayat is run by a non-Jew? Um, right, because it definitely makes it easier. Right, then you might run into the question of shlichus or not, which is just another room for leniencies. Um, okay, uh, if a person's mm -hmm. renting out property, uh, according to, to some post game, you have to make a tznai, you have to make a um, condition in the contract that he's not allowed to uh, do anything against shmita in the garden. Uh, because a renter doesn't relieve you of the ownership of the property. And he will be doing work on your property for Shemitah. So according to many post you have to put a condition that he's not allowed to. That the owner cannot come and do work on the renter. The renter doesn't. The renter. If the owner's coming, it's not your problem. It's his problem. He's the one on who owns the, the property. On the property you're renting from him, he can do whatever he wants. It's his property. But as an owner and someone's renting, you put a condition in the contract, you cannot work the garden during the seventh year. If he does anyways, again, we come to the question, is it enough to say no to him? Here it's a much stronger uh, argument to say that you should be mafkir your garden during the seventh year. To make it ownerless, say, I'm relinquishing ownership of my garden during the seventh year, right? So that you don't have an issue of... Uh, of you have land that's not being mishbat, it's not resting during the seventh year. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to make the area around the garden beautiful, let's say for example, first of all, so you do with deck, 
next to the door. Can you make, can you work on that? It was not the land, but it's... Yeah, so it's interesting. There are some things which create Mars iron issues. Um, like, for example, we said you don't clear off rocks, but if you, let's say, you want to take the rocks and build a fence, so people looking don't understand why you're moving the rocks. It's not necessarily so clear, right? But um, there are a bunch of things in your garden which are obvious to people why you're doing them. So, for example, if you have a sofa in your garden, m most people know that, a, that that's not the place for a sofa, I hope. Uh, and so if you move the sofa, nobody thinks you're doing it for the benefit of the garden. People think you're doing it because you want to move the sofa. Also, garbage in your garden, right? Bags of chips, uh, banana peels, you know, whatever, anything like that. Uh, people realize you're, you're cleaning up because you're cleaning your garden. People don't think it's for the benefit of the garden. And so you don't run into any issues like that. So also, if you want to, you know, uh, do anything... I mean, show me you're doing work on the house. Like, what's the... Because do you need to do something that affects the plants in some way? No, I'm just thinking like uh, I want to take off some of the wood and some of the foundation that's on the ground. So maybe the ground I have to maybe like patch oh. up the ground to put the foundation. Oh, good. So that's an interesting question. Since we don't do charisha, since we don't do um, plowing during the seventh year, so what happens if a person wants to do construction? Right. That's a that's a, one of the questions that comes up. So generally when you're doing construction, it's obvious to everybody doing construction because there's bags of cement and there's bags of cement and there's tools and right all of these things. And uh, therefore people looking on can tell that you're clearly not doing it for the sake of uh, planting. Uh, according to some post game, that's a necessary condition to do those things. It has to be obvious. There has to be some sort of a sign or tools or bags or something that, that uh, you're doing it not for the sake of the garden, but for the sake of building something. Okay, let's uh, try to jump ahead a little bit. Let's, um, okay, good. Uh, also, any plant, good, so this is, we, we end up talking about fruit a lot, but any plant, any, anything that was worked during the seventh year, it's called Shomer Venevat, right? Either people weren't allowed access to it, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, homeowners, it's an important thing. Right? People need to have access to the fruit in your backyard. If you have a fruit tree, uh, you have to make it known that you have a fruit tree. Um, you don't have to leave your door open because you don't need people walking through your yard at 1.30 in the morning and making a muck of things and whatever. But you should have a sign out front that says uh, Hefker oranges or lemons available. You can put a phone number or you can put hours when you're available. But you have to do due diligence to make sure people can access the fruit during the seventh year. Lemon trees, just an important uh, point right now, or citrus trees in general, uh, because lemons and other citrus uh, fruit will have fruits from multiple years on the same tree, uh, it's important to know what's what. Because sixth year fruits, you can eat during the seventh year without any problem of Shemitah. Uh, and clearly, seventh year fruits become an issue during the eighth year, right? You can't eat them during the eighth year because they're still on, they still grew from the seventh year. Okay? Now, if someone hands you a plant as a gift, and you believe that it was Shomer Venevad, that it was planted and worked on during the seventh year, you can't purchase it, and you can't even keep it as a gift. Right? Not allowed to have it. During Shemitah, we don't uh, take ownership of things which were Shomer Venevad. That includes produce and that includes plants. Okay? So you don't accept such a gift or you destroy the gift? You can't accept it. You can't take ownership of it. Okay, in the house. Garden. Let's say your neighbor has a fruit tree, and the fruits fall into your yard, in your an area where there's mostly like mulch or dead leaves or whatever. Like we're not working that garden. You know, ultimately there is dirt underneath it, but you're allowed to clean up that fruit and take it away and throw it in the garden, right? Okay. What it, if if it has Kedusha Shviyas, then you can't just throw it away. But we'll talk about that next week. Okay. Um, 
what if, let's say, in your front yard where you have tiles, there's a tree coming up or like weeds that could potentially damage the tile. That's not yours because you don't own it. You're renting it. Are you allowed to pull that out? Yes, you are. Okay. Anything which is going to cause a financial loss, you, you can take care of it. Okay. Also, for example, if you have shrubs which are going into the public and someone could get scratched or hurt, you could prune that, or if there's a tree that you're nervous is going to fall down, right? Uh, one thing we didn't mention, a tree with overgrowth uh, on sukkahs, you want to put a sukkah under it. Preferably you should do that before Rosh Hashanah, but if you didn't, you can do it during the seventh year. It just preferably should be done with a shinui uh, in a way that's clear to every, you know, like you're not just cutting exactly what you need, you're cutting maybe more than you need in a way that's clearly not necessarily beneficial to the tree, better to use a non-Jew. Right, but all those things can be done. Three minutes, wrap up. Let's, let's say you have a container garden outside. Yeah, like it's not I'll talk about that right now. Okay, okay in the house is a mechlog, is a suffolk in the, in the Yerushalmi, whether or not your house is part of the problem of Shviz or not. That means that basically anything which is covered and closed, right, um, that's gonna become, that's gonna become part of this discussion. Okay, there's two types of, um, okay, let's like this. This is suffix, so therefore there are those who are matir. Literally allowing you to plant in your house, right? So this is what we spoke about. You can literally put down a bin, fill it with soil, plant things in your house, and have a garden inside of your house, according to that lenient opinion. The Chazanish says, no, we're machmir, we don't plant anything in the house. What's now, the porch? What? What is a porch? Is um, that in your house or? Good, if it's open to the sky or even from the sides. So, meaning generally it's considered outside. If it's a covered porch but open to the... If it's a big opening and all the plants are exposed to all of that, then it, it, it is, and I'll talk about why right now. Okay, the, uh, try to do it really fast. There's something called yonek. Uh, yonek means that the, there's an absorption of nutrients from the air around. Chazal tell us, uh, I'm not a botanist, I'm telling you what Chazal say. Chazal tell us that plants are yonek from the environment around them. Even when they're not in the ground, but they absorb wherever there's access to ground nearby. Okay? So that means even if you have a potted plant, which is not sitting on the ground, uh, it could still be your neck from the ground under it in one of two ways. Either if there's holes in the bottom, which right a lot of potted plants are, and that a hole means bigger than a millimeter, okay? Um, as long as there, if there's holes on the bottom, according to Chazal, according to our sages, it can absorb nutrients from the ground below, or if there's overgrowth around the side of the pot, which is containing it, so then again, it's yonek. Outdoor plants, okay? For sure, anything which has a hole in the bottom is prohibited, it's as though it's planted. If it's touching the ground. No. No. If it's Even if it's on a rack or it's tiled? Okay, so the whole, that's, that's a I good question. That's, that's already gonna come into a question of what's called that it's not connected to the ground anymore. Right. Yeah? But if there's a hole in the bottom and it's hanging in the ground, it, right? It doesn't matter, according to our sages, it draws nutrients from the ground and it's like it's planted in the ground. Now, if it doesn't have any holes in the bottom, but it's outdoors, the Chazanish says that it's forbidden for, at, at the very least, Durabana. At the very least on a rabbinic level, because outdoors people just get confused. They don't know what has holes and what doesn't have holes. And therefore, any plant which is outdoor, even in a pot, uh, we consider that that, uh, you cannot work it during the seventh year. I mean, we work it to the same extent that you work everything in your garden. There's just, you can't do more than that. There's gonna be a difference in the house. I can't, we're gonna have to stop because we say we should keep it to an hour and we've got, it's literally nine o'clock right now. But if you have a plant in your house, let's make it the, the the heter, and then next week I guess we'll take some time to talk about what's not permissible. If you have a plant which has no way of connecting to the ground, uh, tiles is a problem because tiles are porous, they're made out of um, you know, a clay or pottery or whatever it is, 
If they're glazed, that could be a different question. Okay, but like we're on the first floor up from the ground. Yeah. So that's it's a it's yeah I know there's a disagreement amongst the post game if uh, on the first floor tiles is already enough then there are even those who say on the second floor there are those who say that it is second people who say on the second floor okay, it's not there's enough. There's a tray. Oh. Under it. Good. Okay. Good. And it's sitting good. On, on a ledge. Or on things which are things which are not porous. On the that's one floor up. So things which are not porous, like glass, metal, plastic, even a plastic bag. If they're sitting under the pot, that's enough. It's called, it's not connected to the ground, but that includes the leaves also. It has to, right? Mm -hmm. But if the whole plant is contained inside of an area which is not porous, then you don't have a problem of it being yonek, and Shemitah doesn't apply. Do whatever you need to to that plant. But if it is porous somehow on the bottom, and we'll get a discussion about first floor, second floor, that will have to do everything like that next week. Um, then it's like it's in your garden and it's the same, everything applies. Except one advantage is there's no prohibition of speaking on plants in your house. Which means that if you want to grow little peppers in your house, you don't have to worry about the speaking issues. If you have like a... What if you go